this should have been detected. Hamas is the group that the Israelis are most concerned about monitoring. And in theory, they have them shot through with plenty of human intelligence gathering operations. And of course, it's right on their borders. So signals intelligence should be pretty good. And the idea that you could have conservatively 500 Hamas fighters, probably close to a thousand, cross the border in a surprise assault that from 20 different vectors using a half a dozen different transport methods and none of it was detected before it went down. That is an intelligence failure that is just colossal. This isn't like 9-11 where it was some fringe group using a novel method of attack. These are all known factors. And for the Israelis to miss this, at a minimum, this is going to cause the downfall of the government, which a lot of people probably think is not all that bad of a thing. But it's definitely going to cause a complete top to bottom overhaul of how the Israelis do everything just like it did the last time something like this went down 50 years ago when the Israelis reformed their intelligence systems in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War and became the world standard. Somehow, somewhere in the last 20 years, it's all fallen apart and it makes you wonder what else they're missing. But the foes that the United States is primarily concerned about are in a different hemisphere. So you can understand why signals intelligence forms a a stronger pillar for us. Gaza was right there. Again, we don't have any information. The most logical conclusion today, which might be proven wrong tomorrow, is that it's a new faction within Hamas because there's there's dozens of them. And it could just be a new one that popped up and somehow managed to recruit several hundred people. You're looking at things that Hamas has now done in the last week that even ISIS never got around to doing in terms of just the human denigration. And so it's going to be very, very difficult for the folks in Riyadh to still proceed to cut a deal with Israel. Now, for those of you who don't like live and breathe this area, a quick primer, there are lots and lots and lots of factions across the Middle East, but there's really four that matter. You've got the Turks, different ethnicity, but Sunni Muslim, semi-secular. You've got the Sunnis, which Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Egypt, that's the dominant group, Sunni Arabs. The third group are the Israelis, the Jews, and then the fourth are Shia Persian. So different religious sect, different ethnicity, and that's Iran. And what has been going on for the last, let's call it a decade, but really intensely started in the second year of the Trump administration, was a normalization of of the relationship between the second and the third factions. The Sunni Arabs that make up the, the vast majority and the vast majority of the economy, and then the Jews who have the technology and the relationship with the United States. And the idea was that if you can get those two factions on the same side, then the rest of the Middle East will more or less take care of itself. Now, there are any number of ways that you can manage the Middle East. This is one. I'm not saying it's better or worse than anyone, than any particular one, but this is the one that the Biden and the Trump administrations broadly agreed on behind closed doors. They will never say that out loud, but it's it's a by administration strategy. And the United Arab Emirates and Morocco have already gone down that path. And the question was whether Saudi Arabia, the biggest, the most powerful, the richest of the Sunni states would follow. And within Riyadh, there is a familial argument. I mean, we, we all know about those intergenerational arguments we have at family reunions, where all the aunts and the uncles and the parents are on one side and all the cousins and the kids are on the other side. And it doesn't matter how old you are, those arguments really don't change. Well, for the older generation, the defining characteristics of the Arab identity is that the Palestinians are Arabs too. And so any sort of deal that is struck with anyone has to at least pay homage to the idea that the Palestinians should be able to control their own territory. But the next generation down, led by Mohammed bin Salman, excuse me, uh, who's a millennial, is like, yeah, whatever, that's your problem, old man. Uh, the Palestinians have never done anything for us. Uh, Gaza is an open air prison camp. Even if we wanted to do something with it, we couldn't with all of our money. So just let it rot and let's cut a deal with the power that matters, and that's Israel. And that will usher in a new Middle East where we lead the entire Arab world against Iran. Now, that might be a little over-optimistic, but it's not ridiculous. So what's going on in Riyadh right now is the older generation, which includes the king, and the younger generation, which includes the king apparent, are fighting about it. And we will know within a month who comes out on top based on what the Saudi position is versus Iran and Hamas, TBD. 
And something to remember with all of this is these two countries started this without us. When we made it very clear that we weren't thrilled with the Israelis for uh, things they were doing in the occupied territories, we withdrew some military support. And we did the same for the Saudis for what they were doing in their own region. And so the Israelis and the Saudis for about 15 years now have been playing the United States are off of them each other uh, and in doing so have gotten more weapons and more technology and more funding that we than we would have normally generated with the israelis providing military training for the saudis and the saudis providing intelligence on iran for the israelis they already have de facto a fairly robust bilateral relationship the question is whether the united states feels it needs to have an active role in that so our role in these talks have mostly been hand-holding this isn't like discussions between us and the Iranians where we don't meet directly and the Swiss have to run back and forth with messages. We're kind of the third wheel here. If it wasn't for the hostage situation, the U.S. would have no interest in being anywhere near this. But one of the kind of the, the unofficial agreements that you make with the U.S. government, if you're a citizen, is that no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter your circumstances, no matter your crimes, we will come for you. And as soon as we know where those hostages are, we will go in hard. We will not subcontract that out to a third party. And that's why the carrier is in place. And that's the only reason the carrier is in place. Uh, people like to say, oh, this is a deterrent for Hezbollah, but we're not going to get involved in that because it's not the sort of situation that a carrier can fix. If you want to root out Hezbollah, very different circumstances from Hamas. Hamas is several thousand, several tens of thousands, several hundred thousand don't know what the number is uh, among a densely populated open air prison of three million people yeah. and going door to door to through that to clear it out even if we threw the entire u.s military at that that would not be enough for that job so i do not envy what's in front of the israelis or in front of the palestinians on that front there is no way that is going to be anything but hideous lebanon actually has terrain uh, it's mountainous, there are forests, and so it's a more traditional Afghan-style operation, if you will, and we want nothing to do with that. We had 20 years of that, thank you, we're done. Uh, the, the Israelis, I don't think, have a nuclear power system, uh, but they do have a couple hundred tactical nukes, which are more than enough for their strategic needs. They might, 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 they're very cagey on this, have a few city flatteners just in case Iran gets too uppity. But that is, it's all designed as a last ditch. This is what we do when the last of us is going into the ocean because we've been overrun sort of play. They, they don't have a strategic doctrine for anything less than that. As for the Saudis, um, the Saudis have a lot of military stuff on paper, but it's all shrink wrapped and stored in air conditioned warehouses. And they only very, very recently started training on any of it themselves when they came to the conclusion that the U.S. really really had no interest in coming to pull them out of the fire if they pick a fight with someone, including Iran. Iran, of course, has a nuclear weapons program, but has not been able to create a device, much less a deliverable weapon. And to be perfectly blunt, it's not clear that they're going to be able to. They might, they probably will be able to get enough fissile material to do it. But Iranian engineers are not world class, and they were not world class by definitions in the 1940s, much less today. So I would think that if the Iranians were ever going to get a weapon, they would have done it already. But if I'm wrong, and they are closer than I think, then I will bet my entire life that the Saudis will go to Pakistan and purchase a few nukes the next day. Saudi technical acumen is significantly below that of Iran's but they've got a really big checkbook. And there are some people out there who have nukes who with the right number would sell. And the Saudis have already set that up. So it can happen very, very quickly should they feel so pressed. But the US will have nothing to do with that. If anything, the US would do a significant amount of things to prevent it from happening, but I don't think we could stop it. But let's start at what it was before the assaults. Uh, this was an open air prison camp. This is an area that has no economic reason to exist. It is a prison camp. And as such, there is no meaningful trade. It's dependent upon the outside world for over 90% of their food and 100% of their energy. Those supplies either come from Israel directly as a kind of a drip feed just to keep the place quiet or international donations. And that is the entire story. So while I don't obviously do anything but vomit when I see what has happened and what Hamas has done. 
you have to admit when the best that you could hope for is to be mayor of a prison camp. That, that's the height of social, social and technological achievement in Gaza. You can understand why some people choose some darker paths. They'll never get back to where they were. Israel controls all but one sliver of the border, which is with, it, with, with Egypt. And that's where the tunnels are that allow the Palestinians to smuggle things in. At a minimum, the minimum response that we will see out of Israel is clearing out an area maybe a quarter of a half mile thick and compressing the prison even a little bit more to make sure that none of those tunnels can ever be used again. And they, these people will be completely at the mercy of whatever the Israeli political system allows. And I don't see another way out of that because the Egyptians are the only other country in play here. They're on the wrong side of the Sinai to project power here. And even if they could project power, they're not going to do it to free Gaza because even if the walls went away tomorrow, then it's an open air prison camp with fewer walls. There is not a future here. And now that we've seen very clearly that Hamas cannot not only not only patrol its own territory, prevent things like this from happening, but actually encourage things like this to happen. There is no administration that can go in there and fix this. Uh, so you're looking at a degree of organizational chaos if the Israelis win and do root out Hamas. And if they fail, then you're talking about a state of on again, off again, open warfare with a people that have nowhere to go. Uh, the humanitarian scale of what's about to happen is going to be horrific. There's no win here for anyone, so be careful who you condemn.